is that well. Can you check the rotation on her head, please, sir? And just derotate her. Just do your best. Maybe a little inline traction and a little derotation. Neutral, right? Neutral, yeah. And let's do a quick shot. All right, looks good. Go lateral. That's perfect. Thank you. We're just to the my side of the midline, which is her right. We're done. You're done. Doctor, you're good. Thank you. We're just going to go back to a lateral view. So we're starting at 5, 6, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Everybody in agreement? We're at C5, 6. Our patient has a thick neck, but we we're uh, fortunate enough and stay there. Uh, Jordan's done a phenomenal job. Shot. Yep, stay there. Okay, we're going to do our discogram. So you're doing great, Jordan. Do a quick discogram shot. Perfect. All right. We're done. You can relax. Everybody relax. Two, three, four, five, six. Luis, you agree? Five, six. This is a, a patient with really four disc herniations. C3, 4, 4, 5, 5, 6, 6, 7. None of them are big. They're all small. And she's having pain in her neck shot. All right, now I need a little pull. Just not too much. That's good. All right, perfect. So for those of you that can see the fluoro, you may want to cone it down a little bit so we don't have so much white and overexposure on the soft tissues up front. The back, keep the back, just move the front in. Good. And now let's see what we got there. That's better, much better. Look at that, beautiful. So you could actually see a tear in the back of the disc and the dye has leaked out. Look at that herniation back there. If you look at the needle, uh, you can relax. We're not going to take a picture, just, just not yet. If you look at the needle tip on that last fluoro shot, it's a lateral view, you can actually see the dye behind the disc for those of you who know where the disc is and it's outlining the herniation it's a good size herniation actually but on the mri you can never really see it not like that on the mri it looks small and that's just because mris are not entirely rel reliable to tell us you know where the problem is for sure uh, if you if you adhere to the old beliefs about mris that it has to be a big herniation to cause symptoms because Hers don't look that bad on the MRI, but they are bad. And we're seeing evidence of that right now with x-ray and discography. So the discogram is a far better test to look at um, patients' discs and to look for the tear, which by the way, it's the tear, the annular tear that is the cause of all of the neck pain or back pain, thoracic pain. We call it axial spine pain. And it is the tear that also causes 95% of the radicular symptoms down the arm or down the leg or around the ribs. And that's because it's inflammation that is the most common cause of symptoms from a herniated disc. Once again, I'll repeat that. It is inflammation that is the most common cause of symptoms from a herniated disc. Now I'm making an incision in her neck I'm using an 11 blade. Can you see that, Sean? Yes, we can. Now, how long is the incision? It's four millimeters, four millimeters. Wide enough to put in my um, tubular retractor to do her endoscopic surgery. We're gonna go down with the dilator, right over the guide wire. Now, I will, I will need a lateral and I'll need a shoulder pull. Nice and slow, nice and slow, easy, gentle shot. All right, so I'm checking my guide wire. I don't want it going forward into the spinal cord. That would be bad shot. So you want to make sure it stays planted and not move. If it goes into the spinal cord, the patient could probably end up paralyzed shot, which you don't want. That's how the Koreans got in trouble doing anterior cervical endoscopic surgery and why they stopped doing it. Okay, shot, that's perfect. That's beautiful, go with an AP. So we got two, three, four, five, six. We're right at the anterior longitudinal ligament in the front of the spine, I've got it. Whoop. And just take your time and give me a good shot. All right, beautiful. Look where the tip of that uh, dilator is.
just on the front side of the disc. It's dead center. And it's just inside the longus coli muscles. If you know the anatomy of the spine and the muscles around it, the longus coli muscles go to lateral are two um, like muscles that run on the front of the spine and inside their sheath is the sympathetic trunk. So we're right on the ALL just between the longus coli muscles. It's perfect. And I'm going to now advance the dilator through the ALL. You can see we've had two drops of blood. As a matter of fact, really all the bleeding we've had is from me sticking the, the local needle, the needle for injecting local, lateral, into the skin to inject the numbing medicine. So really the, the bleeding is just from the injection of numbing medicine, shot. All right, so I'm slowly advancing and I'm watching my guide wire. I'm pushing and twisting, which is the proper method. Of course, I developed the method. So that is the proper method. I'm encountering a little bit of resistance. Now, I am embedded in the uh, disc at this point in the anterior annulus. So I'm gonna take the guide wire out so we don't risk doing something stupid with it. And I'm gonna go ahead and do what everybody loves to watch, banging a hammer with a piece of metal over somebody's spinal cord. All right, there's still some discogram dye left back there. You can see it outlining the, the herniation at this level shot. I want to bring my dilator all the way back shot to the herniation shot. And basically it's at the back of the disc and it's right where the bones end. You can kind of see the outline of the back of the vert vertebral bodies and the back of the disc. And you can see the herniation goes past that. See the tip of the dilator there? Just to the right of it, it's like a little arc in dark, a dark arc. It looks like uh, it's just a bent line running um, from the middle of the vertebral body above down to the third way down to the next vertebral body. And that is the outline of your herniation. Take a look at the incision here, Sean. Let's show the audience how small this incision is. So you see that? Yes. You have uh, something I could use? Like yeah, that's good. All right. So ha if we were doing an ACDF, anterior cervical fusion, the incision would be this long, right here, that long. You see that? From here to here, this long, huge. Why? Because we're doing three discs and this neck is deep. In other words, uh, a lot of soft tissue. More soft tissue means, hey, watch the scope. More soft tissue means, yeah, just nice and gentle. You're doing great, Jordan. And I'm bringing the tubular retractor down. I can feel the front of the spine. So we're right there. And now I need to advance the tube that we're going to do the endoscopic surgery through. We're going to advance that down. <coughs> if you're wondering about this surgery, it is all FDA approved 100%. The surgery itself called the Duke Laser Disc Repair has been peer reviewed and published and is in the National Library of Medicine. It is a uh, accepted standardized treatment. It is basically fixing a herniated disc, annular tear without fusion or without metal shot all right so we're going to keep a close eye shot on the dilator as we bring the tube through the disc now this part of trans uh, basically going through the disc it's called transdiscal and it basically means we're just going through the disc to get to the back part shot so i got to be careful because again, the dilator is on the move. That's something you have to always be aware of, shot. Don't worry about that. Shot. Shot. I can feel it moving. The only thing I cannot tell for sure is, is the dilator moving, which is inside of it. And you don't want the dilator going in and hitting the spinal cord 
because that will paralyze the patient. So we, that's not our goal today. Okay, you can relax. We're done. We are at two, three, four, five, six. You can see the tube is to the back of the disc. Again, this is the Duke Laser Disc Repair. We're the first in the world to describe this procedure. And the primary thing we're doing is debriding the annular tear and removing any herniated fragments we encounter. All right. This is all endoscopic spine surgery. And in 2021, there's only a few surgeons in the world that, that do this kind of surgery. So you're not gonna find this everywhere. Okay, we've been fortunate enough to, to be able to get into the first disc safely without incident. So now we just need to, to do the repair and then we'll move on to the next one. question yeah give me a minute so some of the unique challenges because of this patient's body habitus are that she has um, a large chest anybody with a large chest is going to basically push the um, the endoscope away from the neck from the spine which makes it a lot harder to do the surgery all right I'm gonna try to grab that piece of herniation out and I'll take the question. So we had a question that was submitted via the Duke Spine app after the last surgery had already concluded. The viewer is wondering, if you have severe disc degeneration, nearly bone on bone on multiple levels, is that still fixable with minimally invasive surgery? Yes, we get that question a lot. So anyone with a degenerated disc, <coughs> even if it's bone on bone, is still fixable 100% at Duke Spine Institute, not a problem. We can get rid of the pain in your neck, your headaches and your arm symptoms with, the, uh, with surgery. I can't guarantee you it'll be laser surgery, but I would need to do it on a case by case basis. I would wanna look at your MRI and see what we're dealing with, okay? But yes, we, we can fix severely degenerated discs, no problem. All right, right now, what I'm, there's a herniation. Just shot out from the uh, tear in the back of the disc. And of course, I'm gonna go carefully at the beginning because I wanna make sure, we've already verified that our instrument is not in too far. In too far means bad for the spinal cord or nerve. So, but I'm seeing fibers down there that look to me like posterior longitudinal ligament. So I just want to be real careful. I'm gonna adjust my focus. I want to be careful not to go past the posterior ligament uh, until I'm absolutely ready. And most of the time I don't need to because most herniations, like I said last time, that are symptomatic are, are uh, not past the posterior ligament. They are contained herniations, meaning that they are found on the disc side of the posterior ligament. Interesting. This scope will need to be repaired, I think. Because the fibers are moving, they're distorting the image. See? I mean, we're okay. Actually, I think we're okay. I mean, it, there is some play. So the, the adhesive molecules you see how when I bend it a little, it ch changes the focus? I see, I know. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. So that may be that the glue that holds the fibers, the fiber optic fibers in place, is just uh, needs to be redone. I send it to them to check them. Okay. Yeah. The other scope, I say, hey, dude, where's my scope? And then they say, I forget that I send it to Texas. <laughs> they are very bad right now, like uh, all the parts and everything. Is oh, like look at that scared. herniation. That's another herniation right there. 
So the scope repairing people are in Texas? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Let's so see. Well, they're having that explains. Yeah, in the next couple of days we have it over yeah, there. Good. And that's a lumbar or a cervical? Lumbar scope. Yeah, yeah. Lumbar. We have plenty of lumbar yeah, scopes. Yeah, yeah. Which side? How many of the light cables do we have? Light cable or the camera? We have a set of five. The cameras or the cables? Both of them. Uh huh. Yeah. Maybe we should get some more of the light cables. No problem. Sir. Mm. You can probably find those used. Yeah. Right? Yeah, I can, I can search for those. Just have to be careful that they actually have enough light going through them. They don't have broken fibers. Fucking hell. You understand? I understand, yes sir. I would price them both out, new and used. Not a problem, yes sir. Okay, let's go back the other way. Look at that. That is a big boy. All right, let me grab it. So the person that asked the question about degenerative disc, can they be helped? Absolutely, 100%. There's no degenerative disc in the spine that I can't fix. I can't promise you how I'm gonna fix it yet, but there's only a few techniques that work, so It'll either be a laser or a fusion. And if the fusion needs to be done, the way I do the fusions is very good. We do them outpatient, you can go home. Within an hour of the surgery, if it's cervical, and then usually two hours to three hours max if it's lumbar. Lumbar is lower back. Do we make contact with the laser company? I believe I have a call with them. No, don't believe. No. Can you make sure? Okay. I have a no. Message? No for fact. Imagine if your child, you don't know where your child is. Would you call your wife and say, did you, did you pick up our son from the playground? Or I think somebody picked him up. I'm not sure though. Is that okay? No. So everything here is like a child, very delicate, very important that it's, it's taken care of properly. Does that make sense? Makes sense so we can't just assume. You have to know. The only way you know is by investigating. All right. Oh, there's another piece. So, what's this patient's number one complaint? There's a piece of herniation right there. Anybody know? Is it her neck pain, her headaches, her arm? Can we look at the history there, please? What's her chief complaint? Mostly neck pain. All right, so our last surgery that we did that you all watched earlier, she's already gone home. One hour after surgery, gone. And she's from South Carolina. She's out of state. And she, uh, you'll see her testimonial posted very shortly. And basically she, uh, she had horrible headaches from her herniated disc or degenerated herniated disc. Mostly, it can be either a degenerated disc or a herniated disc that causes the headaches from the neck, okay? 
A lot of people don't know that herniated discs cause headaches. Very common. Two thirds of the patients in our study with the Duke laser disc repairs that we did on the cervical spine, two thirds had headaches. We call those headaches when they're coming from a herniated or degenerated disc, we call them cervicogenic. Cervicogenic headaches just means the headache is coming from the, the cervical region, which is your neck. And specifically, it comes from the herniation, uh, the annular tear, really. And so you all saw that last case where we got rid of all the herniations and her headaches are now 100% gone, 100% gone. I just interviewed her before she left. She's already gone, by the way. She went home. These people that have this surgery don't go to the hospital. They all go home. And if they're from out of town, obviously they go to a hotel or a friend's house. Someday I'd love to put them up in a hotel ourselves, the, the Duke Spine Hotel. But for now, they all go to, you know, the Radisson or wherever it is they got their hotel. We actually help people from out of state get hotel rooms. We don't pay for them, but we, we help coordinate it. Um, so if you're traveling across state lines and you want to know, does Duke Spine take care of patients from out of state? The answer is 100% yes. As a matter of fact, prior to COVID hitting in the end of 19, 2019, beginning of 20, we had a lot of patients, probably a third of our patients were from out of the country or out of the state. And of course that went down to out of country went to zero for the last year and out of state uh, dropped as well. However, now we're starting to see an uptick in people traveling. We get a lot from Canada. Uh, the reason is obviously there's nobody in all of Canada that does endoscopic surgery like this, no one. And even if they did, it would take two years to get in and see them. Canadian people don't want to wait. They're pretty unhappy with uh, what's available. There's only fusions available. Can you imagine why? Obviously, fusion technology is, is promoted by big business, the companies that make all the money from doing fusions, right? The implant companies. They love when surgeons, spine surgeons do fusions or artificial discs because they make a ton of money on those things. I, uh, I think that's one of the main reasons that endoscopic surgery hasn't, is not more widespread at this point because those companies basically don't make money on these surgeries. They, uh, they're losing money. Every Duke laser disc repair procedure I do loses them money. And so they're against this procedure you're watching because there's no metal being put in, no biologics being put in, and there's no cages being put in, no fusion or artificial disc being done. So they're not recommending this treatment to surgeons that they control. They don't want people finding out about this treatment, which is why we have to broadcast it ourselves. How many times is that shutting down? We're done here, huh? Okay. All right, we're done with this disc. Uh, scope off, laser off, everything off. What'd you say? She's waiting on four different messages. She's waiting on call back. Okay, good. All right, so at this point, we, we finished the first disc, and now we're going to do the next one. And I'm going to try to get down to 6 7. So we're going to need, I'm going to need some help from everybody. How's her muscle relaxation at this point? Good? So it's good. So what I'll ask you to do is just some inline traction, distraction. Just hold her neutral and pull a little bit. Not much, just a little bit, yeah. Just gentle. 
and then we're going to pull the shoulders down with Luis's help. And then I'm going to try to move this dilator south to 6-7. Okay, and if I can succeed at doing that, great. Take your time. All right, so you do a shoulder pull, you'll do a shoulder squeeze pull down. I'll do what I do and we'll get the head in a in, uh, little bit of neutral distraction. Mm -hmm. I'll tell you, not yet, not yet. So you can see all the little pieces of disc herniation that have floated out and are sitting right here. You know, Luis, you want those? Okay, so when you're ready, let's get an x ray. Everybody's ready? Go. Okay, what was that? I think one of the arms on the wrist restraints is just pulling the wrist. Yeah, I know, but then from behind you. Take your time. Just don't get this. You got to watch. You got to watch. Do not let them contaminate the sterile field. Check her wrist restraint. Okay, now while they're doing that, take your time guys, make sure it's above her wrist so it doesn't pull her hand, that it gets above the joints, all right? And Jordan, you're not gonna go crazy, you're just gonna do a nice, firm, steady pull, steady, easy pull. Let's get a... Uh, Summer, you can come yeah, do you mind just doing a floral shot? Give me a shoulder pull here, Luis. No, no, you, you don't have to pull, let me get Luis to do it. Well, you guys arrange the wrist restraints. Go ahead. Let's see what we got. Shot. Let's. Ah, that's nice. That's nice. That's good. Stay right there. Don't. Don't leave. Okay. Shot. Perfect. Perfect. Now relax, everybody. Relax, everybody. Relax. Nicely done. Nicely done. Okie dokie, artichoke. Um. So at this point. Uh, we're going to next take the move to go south. So wait, before you do that, let's get the coker ready right here. Everything's good here. Yeah, yeah. No force, no, no tension yeah, on that fine. fiber. Yeah. You're sure? Good. Okay. And then we'll need some inline traction. Just gentle, very gentle, nothing si significant. It's about five pounds, maybe 10. All right, now Luis will get positioned, and the last person to come in will be Jordan. Let me know when you now, just get positioned. Go ahead and take a shot. Perfect. Now, move your fluoro slightly south, just slightly, a quarter inch, quarter inch. And you remember, you're squeezing in, Luis, and pushing down. Yes. And tell me when you're ready. Oh, that's beautiful. Just stay right there. Don't move. Beautiful shot. Give me an AP. Don't move, Luis. Watch your face. Give me a quick AP, quick and dirty. All right, go back to a lateral. And give me a shot. Shot. Shot, just there. Give me an AP. How's everybody holding up? Okay. Give me a quick AP. Watch your face, Luis. AP. Shot. Okay, go lateral. Pull down, Luis. Yeah. Shot. Mm. Shot. Oh, I don't like that. AP, quickly. Quickly. Shot. Okay, AP.
Almost done. AP, give me a lateral. I feel the disc. Yeah, I'm on the disc. So two, three, four, five, six, seven. I just need to get the AP one more time cleaned up. Everybody stay where you are, Coker. Give me a good AP shot. And that's rotated. Give me a good AP. Yeah, bring it towards you quickly. And then derotate it. Go. Shot. Other way. Shot. Oh, yeah, that looks good. Go back to a lateral now. Almost done, guys. Just hang in there. 15 seconds. Lateral shot. Shot. Very good. Everyone relax for a moment. Then we'll get, let's go AP. Everyone relax. AP. We don't need to pull on the AP. Damn. Now you know how I feel. Just take a moment. Let's take our time. Nope. Give me a better picture. Still rotated. That's better. That's, I think that's a little bit more. See the thoracic. I don't know if there's some scoliosis shot. That's, that's good. Yeah, we're actually just the, uh, medial to the longest coli. Go back to a lateral view. Uh, what? No, uh, no, not yet. Yeah, you, I'll pull, you pull, okay. just push down on the ball. Shot. Okay, two, three, four, five. I guess we're gonna need a little anesthesia help. Shot, do one more shot. Okay, that's actually good there. All right. All right, pipe cleaner. All right, I'll need the anesthesiologist. Do you mind, doctor, to give her a little neutral? Not yet, in just a minute. I'm gonna do my discogram first. All right, now we need a neutral pull first from you and then us. Once you get her locked in position, so she doesn't move south. Tell me when you're ready. Ready? Shot. All right, perfect. Stay there, everyone, for just a moment. Mallet. We're going to advance this a little bit more. Shot. That looks good. Let's bring our tube down. Almost done. And the nice thing is her collarbone's a little lower than it could have been, which makes it a little better shot. Come south a little with your fluoro. Come south just a little bit and shot. There. Oh, my God, that's beautiful. Stay there, everyone. We're almost done. I just need a few more seconds. And give me something, Luis. No, move that. I don't care about that. Shot. Good. Stay there. Shot. Shot. Almost. Shot. And probably two more taps. Shot. Yeah, we're there. Good. Done. Done. Everyone done. Nice work. That's the hardest one. Everyone relax. Take a chai latte break. All right, take the, let's take the fluoro out. You working up a sweat, hombre? Nice, nice. You know someone cares when they sweat for you. All right. 
when they release bodily fluids for you? Huh? Blood, <laughs> sweat, <laughs> tears, right? That's passion. <laughs> That's passion. It's priceless. Okay. Got to have fun in the OR, folks. If surgery isn't fun, it's not worth doing. Okay. Otherwise, it gets stressful and you make mistakes. You start yelling at people, which I've done many times. Okay, let's see if we can get the uh, picture on the television up there, please. Huh? What's going on, folks? We do it the same way every time, guys. Be ready. Be ready. All right. No, nothing yet. There we go. Something's happening. All right, good. Okay, so we're inside the herniation. We're at the base of the herniation, like being at the base of a, a uh, I iceberg. What is an iceberg? Yeah, it sits in the ocean, right? So you're underwater, and you're looking up at the bottom of an iceberg with the tip of it sticking out. You're in the water. You're a scuba diver or somebody with really good lungs. And you're just whittling away at the bottom of the iceberg until you pass through the whole iceberg and you get to the tip. That's what it's like. I'm working at the base of the herniation and we're going to follow it right through the surface of the ocean. Okay, and once we, the surface of the ocean here is really uh, the annular tear the outer part of the annular tear. So once I get through the annular tear, I'm, I'm looking at just the tip that's left over, the part that's sticking in the, oh, look at that piece that came out. Beautiful. Stand by, that's a, again, a reverse herniation. We use our little grabbers to grab those pieces out when we can. The other option would be to just keep blasting them with the laser, but it's a lot safer to grab them out. The laser is really good at freeing up the herniations, getting them loose, you know, because a lot of times they're scarred down to the annular tear. They're scarred down to the end plates. They're scarred down to the posterior longitudinal ligament. There's the foraminal herniation right there. Okay, that's the foramen, the neural foramen. Beautiful. There's a piece of herniation that was in the foramen, floating it out. We call those floaters. Not the kind of floater you're thinking of in the morning in your bathroom. These are... I was thinking about the eyes. <laughs> the what? I was thinking the, the eyes. eyes. There are sometimes there are floaters on there. Ah, yeah. the eyes. Yeah. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm so used to growing up with guys, you know. Uh, of course, if you're a Stephen King fan, then floaters could mean something else, right? If you watched It. Lots of different meanings of floaters, but here at Duke Spine, a floater is a herniated fragment that is floating up to the surface so we can get it out. Whew, just a lot of, there's the annular tear, by the way, in case you're wondering, the white thing. Look at that, how beautiful that is. So this is all stuck down herniation right at the back of the disc. This is what normally, if you're doing an anterior cervical fusion, you scrape this stuff out with a scraper. If you've ever watched one of my ACDFs or anterior cervical discectomy infusion, you'll see me using a curette called the Codman curette, and I just scrape this stuff out in bulk. But problem is to do that, you have to take the rest of the disc out, which means you're gonna be putting something in there like a cage and a plate, so you have to fuse. If you're taking the whole disc out, you're gonna be fusing. Patients that get their whole disc taken out that don't get fused or have artificial disc put in, they don't do well. They have pain. 
and they can get recurrent stenosis. Bone spurs get bigger from the abnormal movement. It's just bad outcomes. So the idea here with the laser surgery you're watching is to just get rid of the herniation that and the annular tear, clean them out. Then you don't have to take the whole disc out. You don't have to do a fusion. But you can see how badly damaged this disc is. It's not the whole disc that's damaged. It's just this part back here. Just this little back part of the disc. The rest of the disc looks pretty good. It's not causing pain. It's not causing symptoms. Remember, we've talked about this. We don't fix anatomical abnormalities that don't cause symptoms. There's all foramenal herniation right there, little pieces coming out as I'm releasing them. Those are pushing on the nerve root. This is C67, so they'd be pushing on the C7 nerve root. That's the one that goes to your triceps, okay? Triceps, brachioradialis, and triceps. You know, there's always overlapping innervation, but triceps is the main one. So uh, that was a pretty big herniation in the frame, and we haven't gotten all of it yet, but we've gotten a lot of it. There's another piece right there. Come on out, wiggly worm. All right. And these are herniations, fragments of nuclear material that broke off and went out through the annular tear, and they're sitting in the foramen. Because they're in the foramen, we already know they went too far. They went beyond the borders of the disc. The neural foramen, there is no disc in the neural foramen normally. You should never find nuclear material in the neural foramen. If you find nuclear material in the neural foramen, it came from the center of the disc and it's out of position. It's called a herniation. It has to be herniated to be in the foramen. And all this stuff you're seeing in the foramen is nuclear material. And now most of it's gone. There's a little bit left. You have to be careful because there's other things out here in the foramen, right? Besides the herniated disc. There's the things that are normally found in the foramen, like a nerve root. And you can even have the vertebral artery out here in the foramen. So I'm kind of poking around a little, gently, seeing if I can get any more herniation to move, short of using the laser to move it. So this foramen is looking pretty darn good to me looking good okay there's no more herniations remember what it was like when we started go rewind you'll see how dare you of course feel free she's telling me the nurse is just telling me she wants to change the irrigation yeah so irrigation is the liquid pouring through this thing as we do this surgery. The liquid is necessary to remove debris, cool the laser, and uh, allow for the, remember the sonic boom, the sonic pulse? Can't have a sonic pulse if there's no liquid. So we need that liquid in there for various reasons. Thank you, Luis. Very nicely done. Luis is phenomenal. Have you cooled off a little bit? Yes. Luis has got that hot Latin blood. <laughs> so. How long have you been working with me, Luis? How many years now? Almost eight. Has it really been that long? Yeah. I think you're number two. Yeah. After Foley? Actually, well, first uh, there's me. Patel right oh, Patel. Uh, yeah. That guy. Yeah. He won't be here much longer. We're getting rid of him. Just kidding. That's right. Dr. Patel is has been here the second longest. 
and then Foley, and then you. Of course, not counting myself and the other founder, son, my wife. All right, just about done. Duke Spine Institute is going to be expanding this year. We're going to be opening up an office in Orlando again. We used to have an office in Orlando a long time ago. We weren't around then, were you, Luis? Huh? No, not at all. Oh, were you? No. That's when I had a goose. No, Roger Reed. Yes. You weren't here when Roger was here? No. You start after Augusto? Yes. So Augusto must have just started. Okay, looking good. We're done here. Stop off, please. Augusto must have just started. Am I right? Yes. Like how long had Augusto How long had Augusto been here? When you started? Probably maybe two years or three years. Really? That much? Yeah. Hmm. Unfortunately, Augusto was stolen away from us by very evil people. I know it's hard to believe there are evil people in Brevard County, but there are. All right, that's two discs down and one more to go. So for this one, we're gonna need some help with the shoulders one more time, but just briefly. I will need the AP and laterals. No, no, no. Only, only need lateral in the beginning. So I want to just do a lateral until I get the dilator out and moving. And then I want to start getting some eight quick APs. So that went well. Once again, that was six, seven. We've already done five, six. Now we have four or five to do the last one so hold on let's get every, everything set and I think you're you're okay where you are with the fluoro we're gonna need the neck pulled one last time just don't pull yet don't pull yet guys don't pull yet you got to let them get him get the neck the head in neutral first Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Get the neck. Tell us when you have the neck and the head. You good? Yeah. All right. Shoulders. Shot. All right. Give me a little more south. Shot. All right. Just stay there. That's tough, but I think we're okay. I got it. All right, now we're going to slide this out. Let's give me another pull and take a shot. Well, that's much better, guys. Just hold it right there for a second. Shot. We are out. Uh, I need an AP. Just stay where you are. Don't move. We're almost, I'm almost done with you guys. 30 seconds. Give me a quick AP. I need to see where I am on the spine. All right, I'm off to my side a little bit, so I feel like I went back in the old hole shot. And lateral go, lateral go. I think I'm back in the old hole at uh, five, six. Almost done. Yes, I am, two. So just hang on, guys, and we're almost done. Come out. Yes, shot. All right, let everybody relax slowly, slowly, slowly. And shot. Yes. Everybody relaxed. Shot. Whew. All right, move the floral north a smidgen, quarter inch. And give me an AP. No, but you don't do, we don't need a shoulder pull. No shoulder pulls, just an AP. This, I can handle it myself shot okay a little to my side need to be back to the middle and shot perfect a uh, lateral by the way we've had one drop of blood in case you're wondering 
one drop, maybe a drop and a half. I'm kind of looking at it right now. Is that lateral? Huh, interesting. Stay there. Boy, her shoulders come up high. Shot? Is her uh, paralytic wearing off or shot? That felt pretty good. I want to go a little more. Give me an AP right now. Yeah, don't manipulate her at all. I'm almost done. Shot. God, that's perfect. Back to a lateral. So we are just about to enter the C45 disc. It's the third disc that I'm fixing on this patient today. Uh, I need to be a little bit higher. Shot. That's perfect. Let's go AP one more time. Remember I told you, never go into the disc until you verify on an AP that you're in the middle. Two. That's perfect. Lateral. And by the way, I'm pushing down with the tip, locking it on the a ALL, anterior longitudinal ligament. I don't want it moving. All right. I love it. It's perfect. Now I'm going to go in and give it a little little kiss shot oh yeah shot through the ALL now I'll verify one more time AP that it hasn't moved out of position it's very important you don't move out of position there's a lot of very very delicate soft tissue structures and steel is always going to win against things like the carotid artery the jugular vein the sympathetic trunk the esophagus, the trachea, blah, 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 the thyroid. Cut. Perfect. Okay, we are going into our last disc. Two, three, four, five. Everyone agree? Four, five? Yes? Shot. All righty then. We're going to do our discogram to stain the nucleus and the annular tear. Easier for me to fix when I can see them better. Shot. Oh, yeah. You can already see there's a tear there because the, the um, stick went right through it and I didn't apply any force. Shot. Bam. There's your tear. Shot. One more time. AP. Coker. Yeah, let's just do the coker first. Then we'll go back to a lateral. Shot. Perfect. You see the tears on both sides? Lateral. So I'm still in pretty much in the midline. I'm going to go off to the patient's left because that's their majority arm symptom side, but we are going to fix both. We're going to fix both sides. I'm able to sweep the tube. Oh, you can see the herniation, by the way, just past the tip. It's kind of like bulging backwards. Um, Sean, for our viewers, this is the endoscopic tube. I do the whole Duke laser disc repair. It's a surgical procedure we pioneered here at Duke Spine Institute. Everything we use is FDA cleared and approved. And as I mentioned 45 minutes ago, our first patient is already gone, the one before her. This is a her. She's already gone home, actually back to her hotel because she's from South Carolina here with her husband. And she was told she needed a fusion. She didn't want a fusion shot. Neither of these patients wanted fusions, okay? The dilator moved, I need to put it back. Shot? Yes? We have a question. Yes. One of our viewers on Facebook is wondering, in your opinion, how common do you think it is for doctors to prescribe treatments based on MRI reports rather than examining patient symptoms and listening to them? Oh, wow, what an amazing question. Thank you for asking. Who was this that asked, Sean? Her name is Sue. Sue. Sue from Facebook. How often do doctors just treat patients based on MRIs rather than the pa patient's physical exam? Uh, too often. Probably, I would guesstimate around 90% of the time. Um, I hear it all the time. Patients come see us and they say, oh, the last surgeon I went to that recommended surgery didn't even examine me. They just walked in the room and said, you need surgery, 
<laughs> and then they, they walked out. Um, basically, the physical exam has, has really been ignored, and I can tell you why. It's very obvious to me. The insurance companies are the cause. They have decreased the reimbursements to doctors to such a point that doctors are looking for every way, every corner they can cut, every corner they can possibly cut without compromising care. And there's this dogmatic belief or philosophy in medicine that diagnostic imaging answers all the questions about what is the diagnosis and treatment. Um, the problem with degenerative spine conditions is that MRIs, x-rays, CAT scans, ultrasounds, nerve tests, none of those tests tell you definitively where the patient's pain's coming from. And if you just rely on an MRI, you're gonna be wrong most of the time. Uh, about at least 75% of the time you'll be wrong. You must examine the patient. Now, if somebody has a tumor, right, a brain tumor, the exam's important, but the brain tumor, you know where it is because the MRI tells you. So you rely more heavily on the MRI when you're taking a brain tumor out. I mean, you, you have to use the MRI, period. Um, when you're diagnosing and treating the cause of back and neck pain, then the MRI is less important, still important, but the physical exam becomes the most important diagnostic tool a doctor could possibly have, the physical exam. It is by far the most important. If I had to choose one tool of everything available in the world to diagnose someone with chronic back or neck pain, it would be the physical exam. Hands down, no doubt in my mind. And I would say 90% of doctors today don't rely on the physical exam when they're trying to diagnose and treat chronic back or neck pain. So yes, whoever asked that question, Sue, I believe you said, thank you. Great question, very important topic. One of the reasons we do our broadcast, folks, Obviously, they're all for educational purposes. But one of the reasons we do the broadcast is to educate the public, you, people watching, anyone out there, on the latest um, knowledge about diagnosis and treatment of chronic back and neck pain. And um, there's so much misinformation out there in the public about the causes and proper treatments. And it's only gonna get worse. And I'm gonna tell you why it's only gonna get worse. Because doctors aren't learning from their mistakes. They're not learning from their mistakes. And there are also special interests. Oh, look at that herniation. Oh, ho, 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 ho. you guys see that come out of the tear? That's beautiful. That's like a giant kaiju. That's a, what is it, level four? Forgot what they call them. Is it level? Level four? Grade four? Help, help us, somebody on the internet. So, um, the, I need to hear an answer from Sean at some point. But um, the reason why things are getting worse in medicine is number one, doctors are not learning from their mistakes um, for several reasons. The most important is they don't believe they're making any mistakes. Uh, you can't learn from a mistake if you don't first acknowledge you've made a mistake. So that's the biggest problem, doctors are not acknowledging the mistakes they're making. Um, there are neurosurgeons, leaders in the industry, leaders in America who are aware of this surgery and yet they, they completely uh, discredit it or ignore it, that it exists. And why? Lots of reasons why. Probably the most important is their arrogance. They, 
They don't want to believe that there's something this different, this significant out there that's been going on for several years that they are unaware of, that it even exists. That's number one. So ego, okay, they're egos. Number two, many of these doctors that control the flow of information and knowledge in neurosurgery and spine surgery, they're on the take from the c companies that manufacture implants, the companies that manufacture screws, rods, metal plates, cages, all the fusion devices, everything in the fusion industry is controlled by multi-billion dollar companies that are so powerful. They're not as powerful as the insurance companies, but they're second. They're basically pharma companies, implant companies, okay? They don't sell drugs, they sell biologics, and they sell metal and plastic. Here's another herniation. They don't want this surgery out there, period. They've seen it, they're aware of it, they know about it, and they are blocking it. So the public can't find out about it. That's a 100% fact. I've heard it from my colleagues, my neurosurgery colleagues, that want to learn this technology, but they've been stymied in their quest for this knowledge. So, and then of course, this is a difficult surgery to learn to do. It's not something you wake up one day and go, you know what, I think I'm gonna try a different cereal today. I'll have Raisin Bran instead of Cheerios. It's not like that. It, it requires somebody to train you. Someone who's highly skilled, and there's only one person in, really in the United States doing this, this exact surgery, and that's me. Now I've offered to train people, but the truth is to learn, they're gonna have to take time away from their busy schedule, okay? They're gonna have to stop seeing patients in their practice. Let's say that you're, you're in North Carolina. You gotta literally ask your partners to take care of your patients for a year while you come to Duke Spine to learn how to do the surgery. That doesn't happen in medicine. Doctors don't go away for a year to learn how to do a treatment. Um, I didn't do that for a year. I didn't learn this in a year. I learned it pretty quickly, okay? So I could, I could be critical of myself, but the truth is, is that I'm an exceptional surgeon. I always have been. And so I was able to learn it quickly. But most surgeons are not like me. Um, remember, I, I am the valedictorian in my medical school class. And I was one of the top choices for neurosurgery for the country when I applied in 1996-97, okay? So I have the ability to learn things quickly because I have a good understanding of the anatomy. And truth is most surgeons cannot learn this technique uh, in a weekend course. It's, it's far more complicated than that. So they're gonna have to make a real sacrifice in their lives, professionally, personally, and I am not going to be paying them oodles of money to learn my technique. It's the other way around. In medicine, if you want to learn from someone, you pay them. So there's lots of barriers or obstacles to a adoption of this technology. And I'm just talking about it because I want people to understand the truth. I don't want you guys wondering, why isn't this done elsewhere? Well, the reason it's not done elsewhere is for the reasons I just told you. Oh, and by the way, fusions pay more money. As a surgeon, you make more money doing a fusion, an artificial disc, than you do this surgery. I make a lot less. I could easily make $10,000 in surgeon's fees for a fusion. So I take a pay cut, but why? Because money isn't everything. The truth is I want this technology to get out there and I want patients to have access to it. I want them to be able to have it. That's what doctors are supposed to do. We're supposed to sacrifice for our patients. That's what my dad taught me. He was a doctor. He made lots of sacrifices. So I grew up believing in that. He was an OB-GYN. He taught at USC in Los Angeles, his faculty. He was also a private practice OB-GYN. And 
his philosophy was that you make sacrifices for your patients, period. You do what's best for the patient, what's right for the patient. That's what a good doctor does. So I've made a lot of sacrifices over the years with this technology, developing it, providing it, and I just do what I believe is right. It's not popular. <laughs> I laugh because I'm at a point right now where I'm trying to expand. So I have some friends that are interested in investing and partnering with me, and they're doing their due diligence and talking to big shot spine surgeons like at Texas Back and other places. And they're asking those surgeons, what do you think about this technology? Of course, those surgeons have never seen it before because they've got their heads up their asses. And I'm sorry if I offend anybody for using the ass word, but I am talking about a jackass, of course. Hopefully that's what you took it as. They've got their heads up their donkeys and they don't, uh, they don't know about it. They, do, they don't uh, want to know about it. You gotta understand that people that lead spine surgery in the United States and around the world, they are the leaders, the ones who are teaching the residents and the doctors, they are on the payroll of the companies that sell the metal and plastic fusion devices. And they make literally millions of dollars. And you never know how much these people make until you get, like there's lawsuits right now being filed by one of these doctors who's a, a thought leader in spine. And he's suing, he's made like $22 million from one of the companies. There's another guy who's Mickelson, he's made billions of dollars working with the implant companies. So these people are getting rich, heavily rich, by promoting these metal implants. But the patients are the ones suffering because they're having fusions when they don't need to or metal discs when they don't need to. And that's gotta stop and that's my mission is for people to learn the truth so that they're not victims of greed of doctors or companies, executives, or even insurance companies. I'm hoping someday I'll have other people like me that fight for what's right and what's honorable and truthful, what's noble like our profession used to be. I never thought I'd be fighting neurosurgeons. We're done. I'm sorry I didn't give you more notice. I should have said something but maybe you know by now. That's my fault, I take responsibility. Are you using Tiva, Propofol, or are you using like? Combination. Combination, that's good. Maybe that's why that other lady didn't have any nausea or vomiting afterwards. Because you were mostly Propofol at the end? Got a Decadron? Yeah, good. Okay, I'm gonna show you all the incision here. Great job, Luis. Great job, everybody. Nice job with the fluoro. Oh, yeah. Tough case. Everyone has done phenomenal. So we're going to take this tube out. We were successful at treating all three discs. And I'm going to take all this stuff out right now. And we'll apply pressure for, uh, for about four minutes. Here you go. Uh, I'm not worried about arterial bleeding. I mean, it could happen, but I'm more worried about venous bleeding. Now, one of the nice things for surgeons to think about here, look at this, the incision, right? It's four millimeters. So when you have a post-op hematoma that is in the soft tissues, it's always going to be in the surgical field. That's the tissues you've opened up to see the spine. But because we've only opened up four millimeters, there won't be a hematoma, even if there was bleeding, you understand? Because the only place to fill with blood is that track from the skin down to the spine. And that's not gonna hurt anything. Four millimeter blood clot won't do anything. So remarkable surgery in many ways. Uh, blood loss, one mil. I'm gonna show everybody the incision. This was a tougher one to do than the last one because she had more soft tissue but we got it done as a team. 
All right, there's the incision. You all see that? Sean? Yes, we do. Beautiful, huh? Tiny little incision. Luis will hold pressure for another three minutes and then we'll put our, our little bandage on, steri strips, and we'll be done. Next is going to be a lumbar duke laser disc repair. How many levels the next one? Two levels. Two levels. Three levels. You guys are lying to me. Uh, three levels lumbar. And this patient will be prone, propofol sedation, no intubation, no general, no muscle relaxation, just propofol. And only when I tell you, okay? So I, I, I don't want to give the propofol until I'm already in the room and ready to go. I'll tell you when. So no complications. Our EBL is one mil. We did a right approach. C. Four, five, five, six, six, seven. DLDR. By the way, we give our films the the video of the surgery to our patients. They love getting a copy of that. Take it home, watch it, share it. Great job, everyone. All right, go ahead and type up your questions, and I'll be there shortly to answer them for you, live. Dr. Duke will be joining us in the room shortly. If you have any remaining questions, go ahead and type them up in the chat now, and he will be in the room shortly. We'll switch to his face cam, and I'll answer them for you live.
I just wrapping up uh, the surgery you watched, which was a Duke laser disc repair cervical C45, 5, 6, 6, 7, same as the first one we did today, and that patient already went home. Her headaches were gone, neck pain gone, and her numbness and tingling in her hand were gone. She was from South Carolina, but this patient we just finished, um, similar story, neck pain, arm symptoms, and we were able to get all three discs repaired. I found tears in all three in the back. Uh, they're called annular tears, and that's where the herniations went out through the annular tear into the epidural space. And those herniations were pushing on the nerves, causing arm symptoms. Also, they were being kind of broken down like a glacier melting over time. And imagine if the water from the glacier, as it melts, if that water was irritating um, to the dura, which is the covering around the nerve roots and the spinal cord in the neck, imagine if that water was like bleach and it was super irritating like it is bleaches with the skin. So there's no real compression, but it's more chemical irritation. That's what we call it, chemical irritation. And so the symptoms that people get from herniated disc are twofold. Number one, chemical irritation from inflammation. And number two, compression. The compression symptoms rarely cause problems. Most people's symptoms from a herniated disc are due to chemical irritation. And that chemical is the nucleus propulsus, the jelly, as it gets broken down by inflammation, your body trying to get rid of it because your disc sees it, the annular part of your disc sees it as a foreign uh, body. It's called a foreign body. And so the way our body attacks foreign bodies, like if you get a splinter in your finger or you get an infection in your face, you get pimples, um, basically your body sees the bacteria, the wood splinter, a, a nail, anything foreign that's not supposed to be there, it calls a foreign body, it attacks it with the inflammation, all right? So you get redness, swelling, tenderness, pain, um, heat, and all that is concentrated right where the annular tear is because the, it's the annular tear that sees the nuclear material that used to be inside the annulus contained. It sees that herniated nuclear fragment that's pushing out through the annular tear. It sees it as a foreign body. Therefore, your vascular system, your inflammatory system, which is inside your vascular system, comes out right there at the annular tear and attacks. Now, that attacking happens in all annular tears all the way around your disc, but it's only the annular tears in the back of the disc, the back corners, that actually cause pain. That's because the nerve fibers in this area are called somatic afferent fibers, and they map out up the spinal cord to your brain on the opposite side, but it's called the uh, somatosensory cortex, and it's um, basically highly localized perceived pain in your body that maps onto that primary somatosensory cortex. So your brain, your perception, you know exactly where that pain is. That's why people with uh, discogenic neck pain, discogenic back pain, they can actually point with their finger right where the pain is. And it usually lines up with the MRI finding of a herniated disc or two. So I was able to get into this patient and get to the back of her discs and basically zap away the pieces of herniation that were causing all the inflammation and pain. And she's going to be waking up soon, and we'll go interview her as well. We already interviewed the first patient. She did fantastic. Her pain is all gone. She went home, back to the hotel, and then tomorrow we'll see her in the clinic. And uh, then she'll head back to South Carolina. Meanwhile, the patient we just did, we'll see how she's doing when she wakes up. It's a little early right now. She's still sleepy, so we'll check on her a little bit. And I just spent about 10 minutes talking to our next patient, who is a Duke laser disc repair, L233445, on the right side. And he has chronic back pain from three herniated discs, and that pain is also going into his leg. So we'll be doing his surgery in about 20 to 30 minutes, so come back and join us. But in the meantime, I'm going to answer some questions. Sean, you want to give us our first question? Yes, yeah, so our first question comes from Sue on Facebook again. She's wondering, Dr. Duke, do you think the issue with physicians treating incorrectly and not developing new techniques is likely due to the flaws in the training program? And do you think for us to change as a society, training programs and residencies would have to change from a fundamental level? Sue, hi. Uh, if it's Sue Griffin, then you're obviously one of our former patients. Thank you for being here and contributing. 
You are 100% correct. The, the flaws in treatment by doctors to patients who are suffering with chronic neck and back pain begin at the level of training at universities at uh, what are called residency training programs. And even if you want to go back a little further to medical school, um, these are things that should be taught at medical school to students because, because we spend our second year in medical school studying diseases. So the first year of medical school is spent studying, usually spent studying normal, right? Normal tissue uh, physiology, normal tissue anatomy, gross anatomy, where are these tissues located in the body, where's the liver, where's the kidneys, where's the spleen, where's the brain, where's the spinal cord. So your first year of medical school is usually normal, 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 and then the second year of med school is, is abnormal or diseases of tissue. So herniated discs causing back and neck pain should be taught during the second year of med school. The problem, Sue, is that the people teaching have no clue that we have now gotten to where we know exactly where pain comes from in patients. They all call it nonspecific back pain, nonspecific neck pain. Nonspecific means there's no specific cause. That's because they don't know how to figure out what the causes are. That's because they don't have the experience, expertise, understanding that we do at Duke Spine Institute. Um, I have been in talks recently with the University of Central Florida. I am a faculty member, a neurosurgery volunteer faculty member. I've been in touch with Dr. Pepler, and I've also sp um, spoken with the dean. And I'm trying to get the medical school to create a spine residency. It would be the first of its kind in the world. There is no such thing as a residency in spine. Uh, there's neurosurgery residency, there's orthopedic residency, both neurosurgeons and orthopedics, some of them end up doing spine. 10% of orthopedic surgeons do spine. About 75% of neurosurgeons do spine. And then, of course, there's physiatrists and interventionalists that do spine. There's anesthesiologists that do spine. The problem is there's no core teaching of rehab, rehabilitative medicine disciplines, surgical disciplines, interventional disciplines, and medical, medication discipline. So to be a complete spine doctor, you need to understand chiropractic, physical therapy, medical massage. You need to understand muscle relaxers, narcotics, anti-inflammatories, um, and other drugs like nerve stabilizers. You need to understand the surgical side, you know, decompression, decompression stabilization, decompression correct alignment stabilization. And then you need to understand as well the interventional side, inject medicines into joints to treat them as part of a therapy. So this whole concept of treating spine conditions, nobody has centralized it and made it its own specialty, and it, it needs to be. And I went to the med school um, about eight or 10 years ago, 10 years ago now, and I told them I'm ready to start a spine program. It'd be the first in the country. They didn't want to do that. Um, they didn't want to be the first to do something. Very few people do. But that's what needs to happen. And once there's a spine residency, and I'd be happy to head it up, then I can start teaching doctors that are interested in comprehensive spine care, which is really what we need, doctors that are experts in all fields of spine, the therapy, the medication, the surgery, and of course the interventional procedures. So we need people that are experts in all four fields that make up the foundation of the spine pyramid. And then we're gonna make progress, and right now, the care for spine and back and neck pain is so fragmented, and the information and knowledge is so fragmented. It's just, there's no hope. There's no, no chance in hell of getting there. Um, so yeah, it needs to start with education at the level of medical school, teaching about the causes of back and neck pain, and then that needs to carry forward into um, a specialty like spine or a branch of neurosurgery, whatever. Uh, it needs to be taught in the residency programs. It needs to be a focus, and it's just not, and it needs to be. So hopefully it will be. That was our only question. I hope you all enjoyed uh, the surgery and the commentary. And for God's sakes, ask more questions and invite people to come watch these surgeries. You're not going to find a better source of information for 
back and neck pain and treatment and diagnosis and surgery anywhere in the world and we do this live for those of you who don't know duke spine institute has a app it's free go to your cell phone or computer and look up duke spine institute spelled d-e-u-k not d-u-k-e it's d-e-u-k spine institute you can download our app there's a lot of good resources and then we have the spine surgery support group as well on facebook uh, if you want to go ask questions and get answers all free okay have a great day